Good morning, afternoon, and hello. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to our webinar today, What Nonprofit Executives Need to Know About Artificial Intelligence. My name is Max Smith. I'm the Marketing Manager for 501C Services. Uh, 501C Services is a 100% employee-owned company that provides alternatives to state-run unemployment insurance programs. Uh, we're the administrator of 501C Agencies Trust, which offers a comprehensive suite of risk management solutions and multiple stop-loss protections for 501c nonprofits. We also offer a first-dollar program called UInsure uh, for nonprofits, government entities, and tribally-owned businesses. And we work with about 1,500 organizations nationwide. Uh, many of you on today's webcast uh, are already working with us, and we appreciate that very much and hope that you'll continue to do so. I have a couple of housekeeping items before I hand our presentation over to our speaker today. First of all, uh, as you have questions, please shoot them to us in the questions module. Uh, we will be uh, addressing those questions at the end of the program, but as they come to you, go ahead and send them to us uh, so we can keep track of them for you. Uh, we will, you, after the presentation today, you'll be getting a video copy of it, as well as a copy of the slides. So we'll get the slide deck to you and a video uh, recording of it to you as well, so you can share that as you need or review it as you need. We have uh, recertification credits today for certified association executives. So if you need those, uh, there is a post-event survey that will pop up when we're done and will also be in the follow-up email. In the survey, just indicate that you need the CAE credits and I'll send them to you. And I hope that everybody will come back and join us. Uh, this is our large uh, webcast. We do these once a month. Uh, we do several um, uh, months for our, our customers, but this is for our non-customer base. And uh, we have another uh, webinar at the end of June. It's our mid-year accounting update uh, that will be provided to us by our friends at Marks Panis. So if, if, if you have any finance staff, accounting staff that would like to learn about the new rules that we've got going on uh, that were just turned on, they should tune in uh, in June. <clears throat> now I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce today's speaker, Adam. Uh, before starting Gravity, which is a technology company uh, designed to Supercharge fundraising for nonprofit for nonprofits. Adam spent a decade as a major gifts fundraiser, so he has a keen understanding of what we're all going through here in the nonprofit sector, trying to raise uh, money for our missions. So today he's going to talk a little bit about uh, how you can use artificial intelligence uh, to supplement all your efforts. So Adam, good morning. How are you? Hey, Mac. Good morning. It's so nice to be here with you. All right. Yeah, I've just given you control, so. Go ahead and take the wheel. Perfect. Uh, you can see my screen. Is that right? Absolutely. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I am. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, like Max said, my name is Adam Martell. I am the CEO of Gravity. We are uh, the first artificial intelligence company in the nonprofit fundraising space, and we're specifically focused on providing artificial intelligence products and solutions for frontline fundraisers and nonprofits. Uh, the goal for us is to take artificial intelligence that's generalized and apply it to frontline fundraisers so that we can help them do their jobs more efficiently and more effectively uh, and ultimately raise more money to support our wonderful organizations. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with you all. What I was hoping we could do is do a quick introduction. I can tell you a bit about my background. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what AI is and what it isn't. We'll talk about why AI matters and we'll talk about AI enabled fundraising. Um, so. Uh, again, I'm super excited to be here, and, uh, and like Max said, if you have any questions, please put them up on the board, and, uh, and we'll leave some time at the end to get to, to as many questions as possible. Um, but if everybody's ready, we'll just get started. Um, so again, my name is Adam Martell, CEO of Gravity. Um, my background is pretty unique in this space because I, I, before we started Gravity, I was a frontline fundraiser, uh, most recently at Babson College. So we're, I started two companies. I had started a, an advertising and PR agency. I started a, a set of healthy convenience stores that failed. I was trying to take Whole Foods foods and, uh, and put them in convenience store size spaces, like 7-Eleven size spaces, and that failed. I got into fundraising because I was a, a men's and women's volleyball coach, and I, I coached some of the highest levels. And, uh, and while I was coaching, I, I got into fundraising uh, as a second job. And I really enjoyed my time in fundraising. But what I realized pretty early on was that the, the tools that we had as frontline fundraisers, they, they didn't come anywhere close to the tools we had in the for-profit space. And, uh, and really, there weren't any tools specifically developed for me as a frontline fundraiser and to help me do my job more efficiently. Um, so 
we had, uh, I was working at Babson at the time and I was getting my MBA at the time and we had a brand new VP come in uh, at Babson. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to take our portfolios, which was about, we were about 150 and he wanted to double them in size to make them around 300. Uh, so he wanted us to manage around 300 donors. And the thesis was that if we managed more donors, we'd have more meetings. And if we had more meetings, we could do more outreach. And if we had more outreach and more relationships, we'd be able to put out more proposals, solicit more gifts, and ultimately close more revenue. And the challenge we had at the time was that at Babson, we had 37,000 alumni and the top 10% of our donor pool made up around 90% of our donations. So we were looking at around 3,700 donors that had the capacity to make major gifts. But unfortunately, uh, we had about 10 frontline fundraisers and we were only managing around 1,200 donors, which means that we had around 2,500 donors that were rated but unassigned. And this rated but unassigned pool, if you look at my screen, this was the pool that he really wanted us to get to because we had done a really good job of cultivating relationships with our very top donors. Our board of trustees loved us. Our major, major gift donors really loved us. We weren't doing a very good job of qualifying, disqualifying these folks in this area, but we had really great people and we all wanted to go on more visits. And when we tried to get meetings and visits, we really, it, it was sort of a scattershot approach where we'd reach out to as many people as we could or the people that we thought that we could get meetings from. And we tried to develop relationships with those folks. You know, it just wasn't a great process and it wasn't a great way to do it. And it was really inefficient. So at the time, you know, it, I, I talked to my boss and, and I said, listen, I, I think we can come up with something better here. I think we can apply artificial intelligence to solve a lot of these challenges. And while I was getting my MBA at Babson, I met my co-founder. And what he had done was he had built RelSci. He was the first product guy at RelSci and RelSci is a data aggregator. And what he learned was that by applying artificial intelligence to the stock market, he could actually predict which stocks were gonna pop, which means that the data they had could lead to stock traders changing their behavior and actually making better choices about the stocks they, they picked. And so when we looked at the, the way he was doing that on Wall Street, we sort of realized that we could take the incredible amounts of data that we had in the nonprofit organizations and we could apply the same methodology to donors. And really what we could do is we could build algorithms that had the ability to predict which donors were going to make the next gifts, the, the largest gifts as soon as. So if we had a portfolio of 300 donors, could we could technology pick the next donor that we reach out to? And so that's where we started. And we, so we wanted to apply artificial intelligence to this area here and really augment our frontline fundraisers ability and help us get to more donors. Um, so let's take a step back and, and let's talk about what artificial intelligence is. And, and we'll go into why it's important. It's how it's being applied. But fundamentally, artificial intelligence is using the technology to mimic the cognitive functions of a person. So when you look at a frontline fundraiser, what are the tasks that they do every single day? I know for me, when I went into the office, I would go into the office, I'd grab coffee, I'd sit down, I'd open up my email, I'd read my emails. And then I'd go and I'd, I'd look at my spreadsheets and look at my list of donors and I try to figure out which donors to get in front of. I do some research about these donors and, and I'd spend an inordinate amount of time doing research on donors and picking the right donors at the right time. That process we learned was automatable. And then machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, is truly data learning from data. You know, if you make a prediction about what a donor will give and then a donor makes a gift, we can learn from those predictions and the gift that came in and try to figure out what the difference is and why it's different. So as we look at the hierarchy of what artificial intelligence is and, and sort of the, the granularity and the, the granular nature of what all these different areas are, there are a few that we'll highlight here uh, just as a general overview. The first is, uh, is image recognition. So if you look at um, the machine learning, machine vision, um, we have this great picture here. And I'm sure you all know who this is. It's George Washington. And I, I was giving a talk down in DC a couple weeks ago and I looked up and I saw this picture. And it was really interesting because I, everybody knew that this was George Washington. And when you get really close into the picture, you can see that these little people actually make up that picture of George Washington. And it's just an outline and it's not an entire picture. And this is how machine vision works, where it sees a, a bunch of the pixels and it's able to look at a cat and determine that that's a cat based on an, uh, enough of the pixels that it can see. So these little people here would be the pixels. And we know this George Washington because there's just enough of these little pixels and little people here that tell us that. Uh, machine learning or machine vision is the exact same thing where technology can pick up the vision of the, what we're seeing. The next are, are chatbots, and, and we see these a lot. Um, we don't believe that, that chatbots are, are really, 
We think they're good for lower level tasks, but they're not great for upper level tasks, for human augmentation. Um, Chatbots replace forms on your website. So if you have a website that says enter your name, your address, your phone number, chatbots are really good at asking you those questions and making it conversational. Uh, when we look at the natural language processing of artificial intelligence and some of these chatbots, chatbots are being made every day more and more to sound like humans. And that's a good thing because you know people wanna interact with other people. So technology is, is replacing the, the first few stages of what we all do to build relationships. Um, so a really good example of this is a, is a company called uh, AdmitHub. And what they're doing is using chatbots for brand new students or students that wanna learn more about a college or university and the chatbot answers a few of their questions. If the student says, how many, how many students are at the school, the chatbot can answer. And the problem with chatbots is that it has to be a very defined question to give a very defined answer. So they have their limitations, but essentially the artificial intelligence here are, is really in the natural language processing and the natural language uh, generation in terms of the actual language itself. Um, and it's the same, it's similar technology as we see in Siri and Alexa where we're using a whole bunch of natural language processing to allow us to communicate with these technologies and these devices in a way that we hadn't been before, because before we had to type all the commands, being able to understand what we're saying, internalize it, decode it, code it into a language that the computer understands, and then give an output. Uh, it, it's pretty amazing. And it's a really great use of artificial intelligence. Um, we had done an experiment about a year ago where we put uh, a whole bunch of technology on Alexa and we gave it to frontline fundraisers. So a frontline fundraiser could say, Alexa, tell me who my next donor is. And Alexa would say, Adam, your next donor is Sally Smith. She gave $1,000 last year and now might be a great time to ask her to renew her gift to the women's basketball team. The problem was that uh, most frontline fundraisers don't want to communicate with technology by voice in their office because it's intrusive and, and sort of a pain for their office mates. Uh, and th there's a lot of key learnings around artificial intelligence right now, but one of the biggest key learnings is that the way we communicate artificial intelligence and the value of artificial intelligence uh, truly defines the experience and defines the way we can use the technology. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but for right now, we, we'll talk a little bit about um, self-driving cars and blind spot detection. Um, you know, we have a car that has blind spot detection. You can see it here um, in this mirror. And what's essentially happening is that the car is able to detect when there are cars around that car. And if you're swerving to the left lane or swerving to the right lane, it would it would tell you what's happening. And this is a really great use case for artificial intelligence, where it reduces the need to execute on a task that's repetitive. We change lanes all the time. Can artificial intelligence give us an alert so we don't have to do as much work? It's not replacing our ability to look in our rearview mirror or look, at, look to our left or look to our right. What it's doing though is giving us indicators to make us a little bit better. And this is a great example of human augmented artificial intelligence. Um, and when we talk about self-driving cars and, and, and sort of all the news cycles we see now, what we know is that um, there are different levels of artificial intelligence and truly different levels of automation. Uh, if you look at Tesla, what they've said is that there's six different levels of automation. Going from no automation at all, you have your standard car, to completely automated. And in the middle, if you look at some of these areas, there's driver assist, there's conditional automation. Um, these type of things are, you know, part uh, the, the cruise control. Cruise control can help you speed up or slow down if you give an input to cruise control to speed up or slow down. Um, or it can speed up or slow down based on what's it sensing, what it's sensing in front of you. And those are two very different variables with the same output and the same functions. But what we've learned is that we're not at the point with any artificial intelligence right now where it's truly smart enough to replace humans. We are at the point, however, in applying artificial intelligence that allows us to get a little bit better and improve the tasks that we do all the time. If artificial intelligence can help speed up the car or give us indicators that the car should speed up or slow down based on what it's sensing, what we know is that that's usually a good thing. And taking your hands off the wheels and letting a car drive you around right now probably isn't a good thing. Uh, and we see that with some of the crashes that we're facing. But no matter what, all technology is going towards doing more of these repetitive tasks. And, uh, and ultimately, we think that's probably a good thing in, in, in this space. Um, as we look at sort of where we are in the general landscape of artificial intelligence, we, we know that we're in this fourth industrial revolution where, you know, the industry 1.0 was true mechanics, you know, it was steam power, it was weaving looms. Industry 2.0 
mass production. They had assembly lines. There was electric energy. Uh, industry 3.0 was automation. There's computers. You know, it started in the 50s and the 60s. And now we're at the, the 4.0 version of this industry, the fourth industrial revolution. And this is really important because we've spent years and years and years and years and years accumulating data. You know, all of these databases, they, 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 they encourage you to make them bigger. They want you to put more data in them. And once you have enough data in there, they want you to add more. And once you've added more, they want you to clean the data. And so what we found is that, you know, adding data to a database was sort of in the middle of this industry 3.0 and industry 4.0. The fourth industrial revolution will be defined not by how much data we have, but by what we do with the amazing amounts of data that we have. And as nonprofit organizations, we have some of the deepest and richest data of any organization in the world, including some of the largest. So when we look at sort of the, the, the data that we've accumulated, the way we think about it here at Gravity is that data is essentially uh, an asset. You know, it, it, it could be oil. And if you look at oil, every, every, you know, we've spent years and years accumulating this asset. And as we try to define the next five, 10 years of what we're doing with these assets, we know that the goal for every organization will be to turn the amazing amounts of data that we have into actual revenue, not just the next steps, but it'll actually be turning the, the, the data into revenue. And you do that by making people, the revenue drivers, frontline fundraisers more efficient. Uh, and that's where artificial intelligence comes in. So if you look at the landscape, if you look at Salesforce, I'm sure a lot of you are on Salesforce. What we know is that over the last three years, Salesforce has acquired a whole bunch of artificial intelligence companies. And they've done this specifically because they know that they're really good at holding data. And organizations are gonna stop buying inputs, they're gonna stop buying more data, and they're gonna start buying outputs. And the outputs are going to be the revenue drivers driving revenue. So. Going back to nonprofit organizations and fundraising, rated but unassigned donors are where we think artificial intelligence is truly best applied. Because you know, at Babson, if you look at that example, we had 10 frontline fundraisers, but we were only managing 1,200 donors. What would it mean to the organization if we could manage 3,000 donors by doubling our portfolio sizes? What would it mean to all of our donors if they had more of a personal touch for me as a frontline fundraiser, as opposed to a large major donor that we don't really know that needs to be qualified being treated like an annual fund donor. And that's where artificial intelligence is best used when it's applied to augment the ability of a human and of a frontline fundraiser. Um, so we're still early in the AI space. Uh, if you look at this, this is, this is the chasm in the technology space. We, we, there's a great book that came out years ago called Crossing the Chasm. And what it really says is that there, there's, a, there's a, a bell curve going from the really early adopters, innovators, to laggards, folks that still have flip phones. And where we are now, we think, is somewhere right around here. We're still at the really, really, really early stages. And so the folks that are using artificial intelligence usually believe that the technology will change the world. They believe that what they're doing isn't good enough, and they believe they have enough assets and data to actually make something worthwhile and actually use it to do something worthwhile. And that's why we're really excited about this space. So Google has acquired the most number of AI companies uh, as of last year. And what's really important to note about Google, because they're one of the most important and powerful companies in the world, is that about seven months ago, Google announced that they were going from mobile first to AI first. And what that means is that, you know, over the past 10 years, every company, every technology company, every database has been trying to sell mobile apps, mobile devices. Mobile has been really, really big. And it's still going to continue to be, be big, we think. We're going from computers to, to mobile devices. But the next iteration is going to be AI first. So for Google, what that looks like is this, their smart reply feature. And the way this works, I'm sure a lot of you use the Gmail app. If I send you an email and say, hey, Sally, would you consider grabbing coffee with me maybe Monday or Tuesday? Google would respond with or offer a response that you could send with, let's do Monday. Monday works for me. Either day works for me. And what this is doing is looking at the words that I sent using natural language processing to understand that I'm making a request and making an offer for, for coffee and offering responses based on my calendar. So it's doing the task that I would have to do myself or I'd have an assistant do and it's able to do that for me. And this is reactive artificial intelligence. It, it, it's just like chatbots where it needs a stimulus to come in and that stimulus 
allows the, the technology to offer a response. As we went out and we developed the artificial intelligence in this space, what we realized was that proactive artificial intelligence would define the space. So instead of Gmail offering a response, Gmail should offer the first action and say, hey, Adam, you know, Sally, it looks like Sally has a few days open. You might want to email her or invite her to be your guest for coffee. Here's the email we wrote. And this is where things get interesting for us because what we've done is we've created a product called Gravity First Draft. And Gravity First Draft is specifically for nonprofit fundraisers at, at, at nonprofit organizations. And what we've essentially been able to do is use the algorithms that we have to pick the right donor at the right time, choose the donor who we think is going to make the biggest gift the soonest, and then next, write the next personalized email to that donor on behalf of the frontline fundraiser as a first draft. And then give the frontline fundraiser the ability to edit and send that email. So if you look here, here's an example of an email that you would receive. And it's not an app. It, 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 it's not a plug-in. It, it's actually an email that a frontline fundraiser receives on a Monday morning. And Adam would be the fundraiser. Gravity drafted the blow email to Sarah McSoonis on your behalf. Sarah's a lapsed donor and has lifetime giving of $80,000. Sarah has an, an annual ask amount of $12,000 and a four-year ask amount of $50,000 and appears to have capacity. Sarah is the producer at Splash Worldwide, lives in New York, and it might be a great time to set up a visit with her. So this is why we chose this donor. This is, the, this is artificial intelligence saying of the 300 donors you have in your portfolio or the 30,000 donors you have in your database, we chose this one donor. And instead of it being a black box, here's why we chose this donor. Now, there's three other portions of this email. There's actually a self-written email. And then there's this portion down here, the, the button itself. And this button, when you press it, the draft that we've created to this donor becomes an actual draft in your phone. And what's really exciting about this for us is that we've built algorithms that have the ability to refine the writing style to match the writing style of the user, which means that every frontline fundraiser is now training their own writing models. So because we know who the top donor is, because we know what to talk to them about, what they care about, what they've given in the past, because we have all this data, we're able to craft this message, and then we pass it through and allow the frontline fundraiser to edit and send the message, which means that they can get more of these messages out, and it's personalization at scale. And again, artificial intelligence is truly best when it's applied to augment a person's ability. And that's what we're able to do with First Draft. So when we look at a little bit deeper of what's happening, we know that each one of these sentences that we create, it's called natural language generation, and it's the opposite of natural language processing, where natural language processing is the input. Can technology understand what I'm saying? Natural language generation is using data points to actually generate content. So each one of the sentences that are being produced are being produced based on a different data point within the database. So if you look at this, I hope you're having a wonderful week and enjoying the unseasonably warm weather you've been having, we know the donor zip code. We're able to pull in a whole bunch of APIs, the, the weather.com API. We can see what's happening in their area. And if we know that the weather's been un abnormally or unseasonably warm, we can tell them that we, we, hope they're having, we hope they're really enjoying the weather. And what that allows us to do is break down a barrier and warm the email up a little bit. The next sentence, I work in the Office of Development here at Gravity University. This is a really unique sentence because if the frontline fundraiser knows the donor, they would never introduce themselves. So we have to know that, and we know it all in the database. You know, if you look at some of these other sentences, um, I wanted to find out if it might be free to be my guest for dinner. The difference between breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffee, we found correlates directly to the type of ask that you're going to make or the type of uh, communication that you're going to make. So if this is a donor that's a $50 or $100 donor but could have the capacity to make a larger gift but it's a long shot and a long way away, you would never ask for dinner because you wouldn't want to spend the money and the time to go out to a really nice dinner with, with your family and with their family to, to, to ask them for a gift because they're only a $50 or $100 donor. You might ask for coffee because it's a, it's a transactional ask. All of these intricacies are all taken into account and we're able to draft and craft the next message that the frontline fundraiser might want to send to the donor, which means that we can get them through more of these donors. Um, and, and so what we've done is we've created a suite of AI products. First draft is at the core, but then we've also created Gravity Guide, which is a weekly email that goes out. And this is essentially your virtual assistant. This is telling you the top 10 donors we think you should be in touch with, what the ask amounts are, um, and what we think you should be asking them for next. And then we have Gravity Go, and Gravity Go is a really unique product because what we're really doing is being able to predict where a frontline fundraiser should be traveling, 
we're able to take a look at their travel schedule and make predictions about which donors they should be seeing there. And then we actually self-write the emails to each and every donor that are in that area. And we personalize those emails. So, hey, Sally, I'm going to be in Los Angeles from May 7th through the 9th. And I wanted to find out if you might be free for coffee. It looks like there's a really great coffee shop called La Roma that's right down the street from your house. Maybe we could meet there at 3 o'clock. That entire sentence, it, all of those sentences and that entire email are all from data points that are either public or they're within our database. And you can see where a lot of the work that frontline fundraisers do to get to those donors, to write those drafts, takes up an amazing amount of time. And unfortunately, our frontline fundraisers, our best relationship builders, spend more time screwing around in the database and looking at the data and trying to run primitive predictive analytics when they really should be out meeting with donors, inspiring them to make gifts. These type of AI first products are going to change the way frontline fundraisers work. So as we've applied this in nonprofit organizations, and we have a whole bunch of customers, uh, we've seen different use cases for different types of organizations. The first is proactive portfolio management. Can we make portfolios larger and help frontline fundraisers manage a larger portfolio? Um, things like machine learning ask amounts have been really good, where if you, we predict an ask amount based on all the data points we have, a gift comes in, and then we refine our ask amount based on the actual gift that came in and the data points that were relevant to making that gift. And that's true machine learning. Um, most organizations pay for capacity scores and wealth screenings. We think that all of that is antiquated. And really, you should be learning from every single interaction that, that happens. Uh, and that's really important. We've been able to automate moves management. This is the bane of most nonprofit organizations and really ma ma most major gift officers' lives because we spend every two weeks, a couple hours, trying to update our moves management and pipeline management process. You know, this donor went from cultivation to solicitation. This donor went from qualification to cultivation. Yada, and, and we move things forward. We've been able to use data analytics to look at a donor, understand where they are in relationship with the organization, and then truly scale out the moves management process, which means that moves management isn't applied to just your top 20, it's applied to everybody and you can make better decisions. So we've learned a lot about artificial intelligence in general and what it's gonna do and what it's done for our customers. And what I'd love to do is tell you about a few of the learnings that we've seen in these use cases. The first is that artificial intelligence is redefining organizational structures. Uh, we have a, a, a hospital that we work with, and they have about half a million records. About nine months ago, they had a frontline fundraiser who left the hospital, and he managed around 243 donors. And when he left, nobody picked up the portfolio because they couldn't hire somebody to pick up his job in time. And at the end of the year, they asked us if we could manage that portfolio and try to solicit end-of-the-year gifts with First Draft. So we sent a whole bunch of first drafts to an executive assistant who wasn't a fundraiser, but was, was really great and had really great people skills. She sent out the first drafts and generated over $100,000 in three weeks for the organization. And what we proved was that the organizational structures, the way they're set up now, you know, we have around 70% of, of, of nonprofit development shops are cost centers. You know, the advancement services folks, the research folks, they don't generate revenue. And then 30% of the, the, the team they're revenue drivers, they're frontline fundraisers, they're actually soliciting gifts. Not the, the actual artificial intelligence and the AI that we're working on has allowed us to democratize the actual skills needed to fundraise and allow folks that have really great interpersonal communication skills to be fundraisers because they don't have to pick the donors, they don't have to write the first draft of the message and learn all the lingo that we use in fundraising. So by democratizing the actual fundraising process, more of the non-fundraisers can fundraise for the organization. And you think about the scale of that. You know, if it's a 100-person development shop and 70 people are not fundraisers, what would it mean if 50 of those fundraisers had a portfolio of 200 and they sent out one or two first drafts a day and got through an entire portfolio of just transactional, would you consider making a president society gift? You know, what would it mean for the organization if deans and, and doctors and other folks that aren't directly related to frontline fundraising could fundraise on the organization's behalf without being a drain to the advancement services and the fundraising shop? Or what would it mean if a really small shop could expand the reach of their executive director and the one fundraiser they have on staff? So instead of managing 200 of the 20,000 donors they have, they could manage three or 4,000 of them. It's pretty amazing. But what, we, what we've seen is that artificial intelligence is going to redefine organizational structures. And it's really, really important to watch as we move forward in the technology. 
The second thing we learned is that domain expertise will define the success of AI applications. Um, if you read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, every day there's a piece about artificial intelligence. And 99% of the time, that piece is about general horizontal artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence that has great technology but doesn't have applications. Verticalized artificial intelligence has been what's allowed us to be successful, solving a very specific problem for a very specific person at a very specific organization. Because if you're gonna re if you're gonna get rid of the tasks that are repetitive, you need to find the person who's repeating the tasks. And so a researcher looks very different than a frontline fundraiser. A frontline fundraiser looks very different than an advancement services person. Advancement services person looks different than a manager. And they all have very different repetitive tasks that they use. But if you look at their job descriptions, most people of similar job descriptions and most professionals of similar job descriptions are doing their jobs very similarly. That's where domain expertise is really going to play a role in artificial intelligence. So it's not good enough to just have technology. It's not good enough to have natural language processing or natural language generation. It has to be verticalized and you have to have domain expertise in fundraising or in any, any of the fields that you're looking to apply artificial intelligence. The third is that Artificial intelligence is creating efficiency through behavioral changes. Now, we work with uh, Babson College still, and what we've learned from them is that with, as they've applied artificial intelligence to drive participation at the organization, they've given gravity in First Draft to every single person in the development office. So there's 20 people using First Draft. There's the, each one of those folks have two, a portfolio of 200 on top of their normal portfolios, and they've gotten to almost 3,000 donors in the last month with personal communication and the difference between you know a donor receiving an email or receiving a, a solicitation or, or some type of request from a mass email and receiving it from a person is really 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 unique and that's what's driving a lot of the adoption to driving the, the increased revenue and driving the increased participation uh, babson's on track to be up four to five participation points this year and a lot of that has to do with the frontline fundraisers being able to get to more of their donors and more of the organization's donors at scale uh, without taking more of their time. So we're really excited about where AI can be applied to change behaviors, but truly artificial intelligence is going to be best used when it changes behaviors. So that that wraps up the, the, the presentation portion. Um, usually at the end of our presentations, there are a lot of questions. So, Mac, what I'd love to do is open the room up to questions and, uh, and answer any questions or any anything that the group would like to uh, to hear about. Okay. Let's see if we get any. Not seeing any questions yet. There we go. Do you do you want me to read them to you, Adam, or are you gonna go ahead and uh, answer them yourself? Sure, I can. Uh, I can read them. Yep. So the, uh, the 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 first question is: Are there any that focus on donors and volunteers? Uh, Nikia, uh, donors and volunteers. So we, what we're doing is working with both donors and volunteers. Um, for volunteers, it's super interesting. Every organization has a lot of volunteers that work with them. And the process of volunteerism at nonprofit organizations is really broken because the volunteers expect to be given a spreadsheet and then they offer to do outreach to donors. And what we're finding is that if it's the same methodology and same uh, process where if we can give them a, a lot of the language and if we can communicate a lot of the language through email and not do it through just uh, through the spreadsheet, we can help them get a little bit further down the road. And we're seeing great adoption with volunteers and, uh, and with donors. Yeah, good question. Is anybody out there using artificial intelligence now? Maybe a couple, yep. Um, so th there's one question. We tend to focus out uh, asks based on the time of year, holiday bonuses. Do you see this as a dying breed based on your data in, uh, input, output? Yeah, the, uh, it, it's, it's definitely not dying. Um, what's unique is that the 
what you know with what we've done we have 17 different algorithms that are able to pick the right donor at the right time and some of those algorithms look at timing some of them look at capacity but on the timing side we've learned a lot about the triggers for donors so we know that holiday bonuses are a really good trigger we also know that just end of the year bonuses are good triggers if you have a donor that makes a gift every single february and they work at ibm you probably want to reach out to them in january because they just closed out their year they know what their bonus is and they're making their bit their gift usually in relation to the bonus that they got, but they didn't get that bonus until January. So when we look at, we use algorithms to be able to look at all of these anomalies and all of these different trends, and that's what allows us to prioritize the different types of donors. But uh, it's definitely not a dying breed, and I think what we're what we're seeing is more of that. You know, if you can get more data on these donors, and if you can figure out uh, more about the background of these donors and the history of the donors we can probably save a lot of the retention and really save a lot of the donors that lapse. Um, we know libunts and cybunts are really a function of not asking donors for their gifts at, uh, throughout the year and uh, at, at the right time. And what we're finding is that if we ask donors within a month, a month and a half of when they usually make their gift, if they make their gift consistently, we can usually close that gift. Uh, it's pretty good. Good question. Um, so the, uh, let's see, the next is we want to use artificial intelligence to make asks volunteers based on data regarding their schedules and skills. Uh, absolutely. You know, th th there's tons of different use cases for volunteers. Uh, we don't specifically look at sourcing volunteers, um, but I, I think it's definitely a place where artificial intelligence can be involved. Uh, if, if you contact me uh, through my email address, we can definitely talk about it. I can tell you some of the places that you can look. It's not an area that we solve, but... Uh, there's definitely some really good uh, folks out there that can help you. Uh, the next one is we are also looking for a software that can be used by development department and volunteer engagement. Many of our volunteers are also donors. Uh, absolutely. You know, the, the, the beauty of, of what we're doing is that everything happens with an email. So in the past, we've asked our volunteers to log into our databases. And it's pretty scary because we're giving them access to all of our constituency and all of our data. Um, then we sort of we've seen the trend where people have auxiliary or, or shadow databases, and, and that's definitely not good because you have to keep two databases uh, up to date. What we think is best is that we're able to push out the the actual data that the volunteer needs, so that they don't have access to other data points. And truly, what that means is that instead of them learning a new technology, you know, we ask them to learn our database. The technology learns them, learns their behaviors, and learns their patterns, which truly allows them to scale. Uh, and really creates a security uh, wall for, for the organization where they're not logging into your database and, and sort of looking around and poking around. And if you've set the, the privacy you know, options incorrectly, uh, you could be in for a world of trouble with, uh, with giving donors access to, to your database. Uh, so it, it's a great application. Uh, let's see. So Stacy, uh, Stacy had a question. Does your system... Uh, right. Thank you letters responses to donors and how important is it after communication of the donors? Uh, all research says that is what matters more than anything. We are having trouble cultivating those relationships. Um, absolutely. So the first draft emails, uh, stewardship was where we started because it's it, there's not much science to picking a, a stewardship. You know, it, if a donor makes a gift, you should be thanking that donor to make a gift. And so what we've been able to do is self write the emails to the frontline fundraisers and then to the donors once a donor makes their gift. And because the emails are written in, in a personalized way, uh, you know, Sally, thank you so much for your $1,000 gift to the women's uh, soccer team. We really appreciate your support and we hope to see you at the next uh, soccer outing in a couple weeks. Uh, thanks again for your support and let me know if, uh, if we can get together while we're in Los Angeles. That process of the frontline fundraiser, figuring out that donor made a gift, doing research about what she gave to, looking at her past giving history and then looking at where she lives, figuring out when she's gonna be out there is an hour long process. That's the process that we can automate uh, most effectively. Yeah, stewardship is a great use case for artificial intelligence. You're, you're welcome, Stacey. Any other questions about artificial intelligence? Anything that you're interested in, uh, in general, in the market? Great. Well, uh, Adam, I have a question. I'll, I'll throw one at you. So as you were going through your slide deck there, you seem to indicate that Google was really a um, a leader in this area. What, uh, thinking from your knowledge of, of fundraising, and, and what kind of applications are most 
nonprofits using now, if they're using any at all, I know that might vary according to subsector, but when you think about the applications being used now, are there any, do you see these current, you know, uh, applications being used now evolving uh, fast enough, or is it is it really still just a wild west out there with, you know, a company like, a huge company like Google doing their own thing? Yep. Yeah, so Google, I mean, they're, because they're so big and they hit so many, I mean, they hit every single vertical. Um, the challenge for them is that they can't verticalize. Their domain expertise will never be focused on the nonprofit space. So the best we think they're going to do is offer smart replies, because if they were to offer, you know, the the proactive, you know, response or proactive emails, they would have to know exactly what a fundraiser says in different situations. They would have to verticalize and they, they don't want to do that. You know, they, they don't want to do that for every single vertical. So they're going to pick the top most important verticals to them. And what we know is that I, there are, you know, the reason we've been successful is because, not just because of our technology, but because of our domain expertise, because we know fundraising intimately and because we know AI intimately, blending those two together to actually solve a specific problem in fundraising with great domain expertise has been the secret sauce. Uh, and, you know, Google, even organizations like Tableau, Tableau is a, a data visualization company and they have great software, but you have to learn how to use Tableau and then fit your entire organization into Tableau. Our thesis is that you shouldn't have to learn your software. Your software should learn you. It should just work. You know, the same uh, when you open up an iPhone and you turn it on for the first time and it just works, you should get that same exact feeling from every software that you use. And that's where we think everyone's going. So Google, will, we think, will be the, the fundamental foundational layer of the technology. But companies like ours will make Google truly verticalized and, and, and successful for frontline fundraisers as the artificial intelligence uh, sort of wave comes and, and as it unfolds uh, more over the next couple of years. Good, so there's another question. Would the database make it easy to report out to donors, volunteers, their specific impact? Uh, so we're not a database, and, and artificial intelligence, to, to be clear, is, is not a database. Um, databases hold data. Artificial intelligence is a layer on top that makes data uh, useful. So in this use case, um, it, it might be easier. It, it might make it, it, artificial intelligence might make life easier for the report writers to report out to donors and volunteers, uh, specifically if you can match up or if they have the the gift allocations in there. We can tell them what, what the impact of their gift is. Um, we haven't really looked at that too much. We haven't been asked for that, but it's a really interesting thought. Can you use artificial intelligence to automatically give donors reports and impact uh, reports and, and statements based on the gifts that, that they've given and the things that they care about? Uh, it's a super interesting use case. That's great. Well, thank you all so much for uh, for attending. And uh, my email is on the bottom here. If you have any questions, if there's anything we can do for you, please let us know. Uh, Mac, thank you so much for having us. And uh, we, if there's anything we can do, please let us know. All righty. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day.